day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, rain and all. Let us gather together as we worship our God. We come from different parts of the city, different parts of even the, the country. We are thankful that we are here together to worship our God. Let us join together in singing our praises with joy, the world's creator, hymn number 312 in Voices United. be seated. Well, anyway, it's good to be back. I've been away in Ontario and uh, I did a wedding out at a winery, which was a first time experience for me. And it was a great time. I married a friend, a family friend, and I had married her parents 27 years ago. So it's not many ministers that can boast about um, doing wedding for for two generations, and I told them that if they had their family quickly, uh, my mom is great at 90 and her mind is great, I said I could marry the third generation. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> but it's good to be back. And a special welcome to Dr. Reverend Dr. Raymond Cuthbert, who's here today, um, who will be preaching. We have had him here before, and it's always good to have someone cover. So welcome. Give him a good St. Andrew's warm welcome. <clears throat> and also, we have some guests here today. I mentioned that uh, there were some people from out of province, and I don't want to embarrass anyone, but they're special guests, and they're Katie's parents. So <laughs> look around, and you will see them and introduce yourself to them. I told them that we loved Katie and really um, appreciated her ministry of music with us. So, so it's great to have all of you here today. Thank you. Also, um, thanks to everyone who's helping with the service today on the sound, on the video, um, ushering, um, singing. Uh, Katie will be singing a soloist and Wes at the organist and piano and all those who make this service happen. We appreciate it very much. And Ruth for reading the scriptures today. 
Also remember in prayer, Alexis Anderson is home from the hospital, but she is recuperating at home. Leslie Rempel is also home from the hospital. Coralie Standing is still in the Concordia, and uh, you can visit if you wish to. Um, and we also want to remember Reverend Lorraine Mackenzie Shepherd. You may or may not know that her father passed away about a week ago, and uh, she rushed home and was able to spend some time with him. Um, he passed quite suddenly from a stroke. So remember her in your prayers and thoughts. Also, there's um, an urban retreat tour for One Just City, St. Matthews, Maryland Community Ministry hosts this. Details are in the bulletin and the e-blast. And if you have loose change, please feel free to drop it in the can at the back. One Just City Oak Table uses that for a new breakfast program. Also for Prairie to Pine, there's a ministry celebration of the, of the new ordinance and those received into ministry, and that will be at the end of June at Knox United in Kenora. Also, there's some announcements for youth. Please see the e-blast and the bulletin. And unfortunately, you may have noticed the workers outside today when you came in. We likely do not have water, so just keep that in mind. When you need a drink, it, if the water doesn't come, it isn't going to come because they're working on it. So just uh, be conscious of that. And as we light our candles, we see the candles on the table and we reflect on what they symbolize and who they represent. We have the light, we will light the Christ candle, which is Christ who is the symbol and the one who shows us the way. The peace candle was lit before the service began, and we pray for peace in our world, in a world that so much needs peace in many ways. And we light the rainbow candle, symbolizing that all are welcome in this place. We light the orange candle, symbolizing those who attended residential schools, the survivors, and those who did not. We want to remember them and be on the journey of reconciliation with our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Just like this, very symbolic of the struggle of residential schools in lighting the candle. We light the blue and yellow candles, remembering the Ukraine and the war there and the devastation and the people we remember in our prayers. Let the candles be a way to bring us to worship together. We welcome all, whether they are present here in the sanctuary or watching online, we welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Welcome you to this place of worship, situated on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, O.G. Cree and Dakota Nations, and homeland of the Métis Nation. Welcome to this place of retreat and refuge, worship and wonder. It is good to be here. It is good to be together. It is good to be together here in this place, and it is good to connect online. Let us continue to worship our God. Let us pray together. Dear God, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for this opportunity to be in one place or at least in one mind as we worship. We are called together today to reflect on your word, to realize that you are indeed our source of life in this world. So we pray, dear God, that you would be with us now as we sing and pray together, that we may hear your voice and understand your way. On this Trinity Sunday, we thank you for the blessings that you bring to us, the God who created us, Christ who saves us, and the Holy Spirit who brings us together 
as one hope for the world. Help us, dear God, that on this day we might find your presence in our lives in one of your three persons or all three, so that we might know the love, the joy, the peace that is ours, not only to keep, but to share. Bless us, we pray you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now is our children's time, and uh, we have the opportunity to talk about something that is probably a little weird for children, and that's the Trinity itself. Now, if kids are saying, Trinity, what's that? You're probably not very different from adults. Trinity, Trinity. What is it? Well, we, we, we know there's churches in town with names like Holy Trinity. What does it mean? Holy Trinity, the Trinity, what is it? Well, the Trinity is three ways of God making God's self known to us in the world. God who created us is one of those three persons. The one who we think of as the creator, not only of our lives, but all life, everywhere. Not only on this planet, but throughout the entire universe. The one who brings meaning, purpose. The one who existed from, if there is such a thing as before the beginning, that would be God. God, our creator. The second person of the Trinity is the one who probably we're the most familiar with because we see pictures of Jesus and Jesus is representative of the person of God who we call the Christ. The Christ is the redeemer, the person who brings us new life, new opportunities. Jesus is the one who walked on the earth, who had 12 disciples, who commissioned those disciples and all those who followed them right up to this very day. Jesus, Jesus the Christ. And the third person of the Trinity is perhaps the least known. The third person of the Trinity is called the Holy Spirit. In the old days, they used to sometimes say the Holy Ghost. To me, that sounds kind of creepy. <laughs> but I prefer the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the invisible part of God but the part of God that is actually the most present to us at this very moment. The Holy Spirit is the energizing force of God that works within and between us and draws us together as one. So on this Trinity Sunday, we remember all three persons, God, our creator, Jesus, who is the Christ, the man who walked amongst us, and the Holy Spirit, who is invisible and yet who brings us together into life as the church. At this time, we'll have our scripture reading. Good morning. Our first reading today is from Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, and then verses 22 to 31. Does not wisdom call, and understanding raise her voice? On the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates, in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out. To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all who live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up, at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields, or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When he established the foundations 
of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, playing before him always, playing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. And our second reading this morning is from Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this glory in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that afflictions produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The Gospel reading this morning is from John 16, verses 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For our next hymn, we'll be singing together from Voices United, number 320, Mothering God, You Gave Me Birth. Voices United 320. 
Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be with you again this morning. Uh, I'm probably not here often enough that I'm a familiar face, but there is a familiar face to you that is well known to you, and that's my daughter-in-law, Charlotte Lindsay. And uh, I'm, I know that you also know my son, Michael, who formerly did video work and uh, for the congregation. And uh, I'm feels in that way, at least, I, I'm a part of the St. Andrew's family by extension. Let us now pray. O oh God, let something essential happen to us, something more than interesting or entertaining or thoughtful. O oh God, let something essential happen to us, something awesome, something real. Amen. According to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 4, the disciples had been told to stay put, and so they had. Jesus had promised them to send another advocate, whom he would send from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who would testify on his behalf. After all, the Holy Spirit is the truth with a capital T, an advocate who would enable them to testify on God's behalf and do so truly. In addition, this advocate would expose the world for what it was and is, with its distorted notions about sin, righteousness, and judgment, and would guide them into not only further truth, but all truth, taking everything that was Jesus's and giving it to all of us who follow in his footsteps. Jesus had told them while he was still with the disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and they had banked their lives on that. They were the chosen. Jesus had called each one of them the only eyewitnesses to all that Jesus had said and done. Jesus had been with them a brief time. How long was Jesus with them? Well, the Gospels actually differ as to the length of Jesus' ministry. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are called the Synoptic Gospels, they had only been with Jesus for one year. In John, it's three years. This is primarily seen because John reports three trips to Jerusalem for the Passover, whereas in the Synoptic Gospels, following Mark's outline, they report only one visit for the Passover. 
So whether it was after one year or after three years, these apostles had been entrusted with extraordinary treasures, although at the time they didn't really know it. They had been given the treasure of God's incarnation, the treasure of God's self-revelation, the treasure of God's presence, the treasure of God's word, the treasure of God's work right among them, the mysteries of the kingdom. That's how Jesus put it. Now, what was going to happen to all of that when Jesus was gone? That's kind of the Pentecost question. What was going to happen to all those things that Jesus taught once he was gone? Would it all come to an end? Had this simply been for them, those 12, now down to 11? And if not, what was to become of all that? Have you ever asked yourself, what would have happened had the disciples just scattered on that night? If they had run away and stayed away the way they did on the night that Jesus was arrested? Think of it. All that we know about Jesus would have been totally scattered and then atomized, vaporized, only to be gone forever, vanish like Camelot. That's what was at stake. To keep that from happening required a simple act of obedience. Jesus told them, stay in Jerusalem. Now consider what their lack of obedience would have meant. Isn't it kind of astonishing to imagine what a simple act of obedience can mean? They, of course, the disciples, the 11 of them, had, hadn't even a clue. They didn't know any more than you and I really understand what it means when we do something out of obedience. Oh, sure, we know what they mean for us. We can tell ourselves, well, that cost me. That cost us. But what do they mean in the larger scheme of God's work in the world? What do they mean in the mystery of God's ways. Literally, only God knows. They had been told to wait for a power that would enable them to be Jesus' witnesses, a baptism of the Spirit of God that would not only enable them to tell Jesus' story with truth and power, but would clothe them with and in Jesus' presence and power. Up until now, the disciples had been eyewitnesses of the risen Christ, but only that. Only that, because on Pentecost, last Sunday, they became bearers of the risen Christ, each one of them a minister of Christ's grace. With Christ's departure, something far more astonishing was about to take place. Jesus was going away, but he would not be gone. Jesus was going away so that he could continue to be with them, and not simply them, but with all ever after who would learn of him through them. And that mind-boggling number beyond our ability to count whoever after named and claimed Jesus as Lord is the number that was dependent on those 11. What they were waiting for was not simply for them, it was for us and for all in between. Though they had all been eyewitnesses to what had happened in a brief moment of time in a relatively isolated and obscure portion of the world, it had happened in order to transform the world forever. Indeed, it did transform the world forever. But for this to happen, the world needed another advocate. And this is the first thing for us to remember in this season of Pentecost. We stand in a long line of witnesses. 
all of them who have received this promised advocate, this promised power from on high, this one whose task is to make Jesus present to us at our every breath, making us participants in his work, whether we're conscious of it or not. When we're baptized, we are baptized in the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And it's that Holy Spirit that energizes us and brings us the presence of God, not to keep, but to share. Present to us at our every breath. Isn't that kind of breathtaking in and of itself? You and I have been given the advocate, both in us and among us, who continues to make Christ present in and to us, even when we're not aware of it. Think of that. Yes, we have those moments of recognition, perhaps, when at the moment we feel Christ's power, Christ's presence, when the beauty and the awesome profundity of Christ's presence touches us, whether it be at a baptismal font, whether it be at a communion table, whether it be in prayer, whether it be in acts of kindness, in moments of truth-telling, when lost in wonder, love, and the praise that is contained in worship. Personally, that touch almost always brings me to the verge of tears, creating with it a uniquely discernible and delicious pain of emotion in my chest and in my throat. What are the signs of God's presence in you? What are they for you? And who of us is not grateful for those moments, the signposts by which we pinpoint, track, and trace our journey of faith? Think of it. Even when those moments slip away from our consciousness and our thinking is focused on other things, anything, everything but God and being God's person, even when that happens, Christ does not slip away. And Christ does not leave us to ourselves. Think about that for another moment. Christ is still present to us. Though you and I may wander, wonder, question, abandon, and even forget, Christ remains present. Christ remains doing the work of God in us and through us until that time when he chooses to reawaken us to Christ. I think probably all of us have had a time when we slipped away before we came back with renewed zeal and power in our Christian living. Do you think that was just an accident? present to us in our every breath, breathing in, breathing out, whether we know it or not, it's breathtaking. But even when we do know it, are we truly aware of who it is that's shaping us and making us Christ's witnesses? Theologian Richard J. Hauser asks, in his book, A Guide to Prayer for All Who Seek God, do we adequately acknowledge the Spirit's role in the good actions we perform every day, or do we attribute them only to our own initiative and hard work? It's a good question, Hauser continues. The scripture model insists that if the action was good, the Spirit was present from the beginning. End of quote. It is the advocate doing God's work, turning us not into simply servants or even partners of Christ, but actually icons. Now, I'd said in the children's time, Trinity's a tough one, but what about icons? Do we know what those are in a Protestant church? 
The simplest and best explanation I've ever heard for what an icon is, is that an icon is a window to heaven. In the Orthodox Church, an icon is a sacred painting, but I have been told that it's meant to help those who meditate to see what God's heavenly will for us is to be. Icons, in the Orthodox Church at least, are portals through whom Christ's presence, power, and work is visible not just to an individual, but is visible right here in this world. The power that fell upon Christ's chosen that Pentecost is at work in and among us all the time, whether we're aware of it or not. That's the amazing grace of it all. God's Spirit remains in and among us today as advocate, counselor, comfort, and help to witness to God's truth and make us witnesses of that truth. This is the Church's continuing hope as we face challenges, schisms, and an ever-increasingly skeptical world that thrives on conspiracy theories like the Da Vinci Code, the Spirit of the Risen Lord is still present in Christ's Church. There is only one ministry. It's not the ministry of Karen or me or Lorraine Mackenzie Shepherd. There is only one ministry, and that's the ministry of Christ. Each of us, not just the ordained, but every single Christian, is Christ's minister of grace, as those eyewitnesses became Christ's minister of grace. And we are to be those ministers in our homes, our workplaces, our communities, our families, and among our friends. That's where each of us lives out the Christ window from heaven that the Spirit makes possible in us. That is where each of us is called to moments of personal obedience. That same advocate that enabled Jesus to be the Christ of the universe, that enables you and me to moments of obedience in our personal lives, is the one who empowers us to acts of kindness, to moments of witness, to acts of faithful service, both within the walls of this church and well outside of the walls of the church. This is just one more witness to the fact that Christ is not gone, but Christ is present in us, in and among us, giving us what we need to continue our witness to him. You are the chosen. Now, who in the world of us, if we're really honest, really volunteered for that? With our chosenness comes empowerment. The gift of the Spirit to enable you to bear Christ and to be Christ in the particular moment that you're called to, day in and day out. You are one more link in that almost 2,000-year chain of people. And even though we're not eyewitnesses, we are nonetheless faithful witnesses to the truth. The good news of what God has done and is continuing to do in Jesus. Each day, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day, is an opportunity for you and me to see once again what a simple moment of obedience can do. The Advocate is here among us, with us, and in you and in me. We are the Chosen. And this is the Church's only hope, only hope. Without us, there is no church. 
Many years ago, the Associated Press ran a story about a virus that infected a flock of Canada geese. The virus destroyed their navigation system. They flew in circles up in the air. They became disoriented and they got lost. Can you believe it? Canada geese getting lost? It was devastating for the flock. Thousands of geese died. What an incredible consequence because of the loss of the ability to navigate. There is that kind of consequence that takes place when we lose our spiritual bearings. In the deepest spiritual sense, we don't know where we're going. We can't remember our destination, and we wind up completely lost. As the geese were designed to have an inner navigational system, we were de designed to have a spiritual guidance system. That's part of what it means to be created in the image of God. The problem is that our guidance system has failed us sometimes and left us with a spiritual vacancy. Reconciliation, though, with God can bring us online once again. It's like rebooting your computer. Reconciliation brings us together with God once again. Because Christ promised to his followers a spirit who would guide you into all truth. May God help us find that reconciliation and take seriously our witness for Christ. Our next hymn comes to us from Voices United, number 562, Jesus Calls Us, 562. In our prayers of the people, when you hear the words, we search for the Spirit, please respond with Voices United, 204, Come, Holy Spirit. Let us pray. 
God, we pray for our world, for farmers who are in need of getting crops in, who've struggled with rain and water. Be with them in their planting, in their harvest. We pray for Ukraine and the war there, the peace that is so needed and the devastation that is so seen on the news and in their lives. Be with them. Let them know that the world has not forgotten them. We pray for the United States where there's protests against gun and violence and the shootings and the pain and sufferings from those shootings we have seen online with lives lost, especially with young children. We pray for those struggling with poverty who do not have enough food to eat, who need employment, who need a fair income to meet their needs, especially in these days of raising, rising costs. We pray for those who struggle with long-haul COVID. We pray for people who need hope and help. We pray for a world that will begin to share its resources so that all may have enough. We search for the Spirit. We pray for those who are sick, who are in the hospital. We think of Coralie standing. Be with her as she's still there. Wrap her in your arms of love. Let her know that we are remembering her in our prayers. We pray for those who are recuperating at home, who have been in the hospital. For Alexis Anderson and Leslie Rempel. Be with them as they are at home. We pray for the Adamson family. Be with them in their grief and their loss and Reverend Lorraine Mackenzie Shepherd and Nancy in their loss of a father and a father-in-law. Be with her as she grieves the loss of her parent. We pray for those who are awaiting news of results from tests, who may be anxious. We pray for One Just City, all the programs of all the ministries. Be with them. We search for the Spirit. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father and our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We bring our gifts and our offerings to our God. We give by par, e-transfer, drop it off at the church in the mailbox, or leave it at the back of the church. Let us give joyfully and cheerfully to the ministry and work of this church and God's work in our world. And now may God bless you with this comfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed 
for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that through your love you can make a difference so that in this world you can do what others claim cannot be done. We pray all this in the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.